Part 2, Lenin's Significant Others. Chapter 4, Russian Foes of Erfurtianism. At one point in What is to be Done, Lenin portrays himself at his writing desk, telling us that I am starting to leaf through Martinov's article in order to find appropriate phrases. This verbal snapshot is extremely revealing. Lenin seems always to have an opposing text lying open on his writing desk, always to be quoting offending phrases, always to be expostulating, can you believe they're saying such things? Indeed, Lenin often allows his opponent's arguments to organize his own argument and to supply the vocabulary with which he presents his ideas. He even states at one point that he prefers to wait until he can present his ideas in attack mode. These polemical opponents are what is to be done's significant others. The dramatic persona of what is to be done's polemical drama are the writers and groups against whom Lenin directs his fire. One or more of the following six characters is present on almost every page of Lenin's book. After the group name, I add in parentheses the main individual names associated with this group. So you have Kreda with Yelena Kuskova and Sergei Pokhapovich, Rabochia Musi with K. M. Taktarev, Rabochi Diela with Boris Krichevsky and Alexander Martinov, B. V., a contributor to Rabochi Diela, aka Boris Savinkov, the joint letter sent to Iskra in late 1901 by a group of political prisoners within Russia, and finally Svoboda with El Nadizhdin. I have chosen to keep the names of periodicals and political groups in Russian while translating other titles. Other scholars consider it more reader-friendly to use English translations of these names. Iskra, meaning the spark, Rabochia Musi, meaning worker thought, Rabochi Diela, meaning worker cause, and Svoboda, meaning freedom. What is to be done cannot be understood without grasping what these significant others stand for and why Lenin opposed them. The protagonist in what is to be done's polemical drama is Rabochi Diela, the main rival group of Iskra for leadership in the Inkoate Party of 1901. In later 1901, Rabochi Diela published some severe criticisms of Iskra based on its first six or so issues. Lenin's original intention was to confine his book to setting forth his positive proposals, but by the time he sat down to write in late 1901, he felt compelled to respond to the attack mounted by Iskra's rivals. When Lenin mentions his what is to be done in correspondence in 1901, he usually says something like, I'm working away on the book against Rabochi Diela. Lenin's central polemical strategy is to associate Rabochi Diela with economism, even though Rabochi Diela was on record as stoutly opposed to economism as an ideology. The classic exemplars of economism were the first two names on my list, the Kreda and Rabochi Musi. We have met them before as targets of Lenin's protest writings in 1899. By 1901, owing both to the horrified reaction of all shades of social democratic opinion, including Rabochi Diela, and to the course of events, economism was completely discredited. Thus, Lenin's aim is not to show that economism is wrong, for he takes it for granted that all his readers of his book agree on this. His aim is to take the formulations in which Rabochi Diela clothed its criticism of Iskra and show that they smack of this dreaded ideological error. Lenin's argument can be paraphrased, Rabochi Diela today is nothing but a confused and half-hearted version of what the discredited, although bolder and more logical, Kreda and Rabochi Musi were yesterday. Although the onslaught against Rabochi Diela is the main campaign in Lenin's polemical war, he fights the skirmishes on the side with at least three names on our list, Savinkov, the Joint Letter, and El Nadezhdin. None of these persons or groups were particularly significant figures within Russian social democracy in their own right, but Lenin used their writings issued in 1900 and 01 to make various points in aid either of his polemic against Rabochi Diela or of his explanation of his positive policy proposals. The group of six thus falls naturally into three groups. In this chapter, we examine the first group, the Kreda and Rabochi Musi, the paradigmic instances of economism. The common thread that connects these two otherwise disparate groups is skepticism about the applicability of the SPD model of a national class political party to absolutist Russia. 
In the following chapter, we will look at what is to be done's polemical protagonist, Rabochi Diela. I show that Rabochi Diela was not really guilty of economism, but that the Iskraites had sufficient motivation to accuse their rivals of this mortal social democratic sin. In a third chapter, I examine Lenin's disputes with the three remaining polemical others. The common thread in this group is, in one way or another, skepticism about the empirical spread of awareness under czarist conditions. Before turning to economism, we need to look more closely at this term that plays such a major role, not only in the polemics of the time, but also in later commentary on what is to be done. What is to be done was so successful in pinning the label economist on Rabochi Diela that this group is regarded as economist even by those who correctly see that its position was strongly opposed to the classic economism of the Creda and Rabochi Amusi. More often, Rabochi Diela is presented as simply the moderate ally of Rabochi Amusi with essentially the same outlook. This is historically and analytically confusing. In this commentary, economism is restricted to the position of the Credo and Rabochi Amusi. Only by restricting the terms in this way can we understand what is going on and what is to be done, as Lenin builds his paradoxical case that Rabochi Diela, the explicit opponent of economism, was itself guilty of it. I judge Lenin's accusation to be unfounded, but even those who disagree will lose nothing in clarity by defining Russian economism as the position defended in different ways by the Kreda and Rabochia Musi. Another common misunderstanding is to equate the statement, I am opposed to economism, to the statement, I am opposed to the economic struggle, as such, that is, to strikes, trade unions, and factory laws. But ism means an ideology, which in this case is a restriction to economic struggle defended as a matter either of principle or of long-term tactics. Economic also had a special social democratic meaning, which can best be appreciated by looking at what politics meant in 19th century debates among socialist revolutionaries. Politics essentially meant insisting on the importance of political freedom, and in the Russian context, insisting on the urgent priority of overthrowing the autocracy in order to obtain political freedom. This is what people had in mind when they said that anarchists or populists rejected politics. But under this definition, certain kinds of political activity, working for factory legislation or even working to obtain partial political rights from the autocracy, were not political. Anyone who restricted himself on principle to these kinds of activity was still an economist. For this reason, even at the time, the term was felt to be somewhat clumsy and misleading. Lenin apologizes for his use of the term and what is to be done and explains that it is a concession to common usage. Once we grasp these background assumptions, the term economism is precise enough as this sort of political label goes. The essential point is that economism, so defined, was anathema to social democracy. Recall Kautsky's words in the Erfurt program, Political freedoms are light and air for the proletariat. He who lets them wither or withholds them, he who keeps the proletariat from the struggle to win these freedoms and to extend them, that person is one of the proletariat's worst enemies. It is no surprise, then, that the Russian economists are conscious and determined foes of Erfurtianism at home and abroad. Their critique not only confirms the existence of such a thing as Erfurtianism, but helps delineate its features more precisely. In particular, the economists bring out the difficulties and paradoxes of applying Erfurtianism to Russia, difficulties and paradoxes that Lenin spent his career trying to overcome. The Kreda, Guskova and Prokopovich Quote, if the Communist Manifesto is taken as gospel, then our point of view is heresy. End quote. Sergei Prokopovich. The Kreda assumed an almost mythical status in the history of Russian social democracy. Every faction accused the other of trying to implement the program of the Kreda. And what was the Kreda? It was a five-page document, scribbled down by Yelena Kuskova as part of a private debate among some young Russian social democrats in Petersburg in 1899. It certainly was not meant for publication, and no one was more surprised than Kuskova when some months later it was published in the West under the imposing title of Kreda and accompanied by a long protest of Russian social democrats that had been drafted by Lenin in Siberian exile and signed by 16 other Russian social democrats in exile. It later transpired that Lenin's sister Anna Ilyanova had somehow gotten a hold of a copy of the document, given it the title of Kreda, and sent it to Lenin, who had no idea who had written it. What, then, was the program of the Kreda? 
We will get to that at the end of this section, but first we should introduce the author, Yelena Kuskova, and her husband, Sergei Prokopovich. This remarkable couple had been shopping around for a political home in the 1890s after going through various forms of latter-day populism. They ended up in social democracy for a few years. They quickly identify themselves with what they consider the progressive wing of the movement, namely the revisionism associated with Eduard Bernstein. Kuskova and Prokopovich later occupied an area somewhere between social democracy and the liberals. In 1917, Prokopovich became Minister of Food Supply for the Provisional Government, in which capacity he makes an appearance in an earlier book of mine. In 1921-2, the couple helped organize a Russian committee to combat the famine in the Volga region and were deported from Russia by Lenin for their pains. In immigration, Prokopovich continued to produce valuable studies of the Soviet economy. Luckily, we have other sources for their views than a solitary scribbled document, although all of their writings from this period have a similarly odd publication history. In early 1900, as part of his ongoing war with Rabochi Diela, Plikhonov published his Vedimikum, consisting primarily of unpublished material by Kuskova and Prokopovich. Included was an unpublished pamphlet by Prokopovich that contained a stinging attack on the Emancipation of Labor Group, a letter written by Kuskova to Axelrod, and other private letters from a number of the Rabochi Diela editorial staff, who knew Prokopovich and described his views. The ethics of Plikhanov's publication of this material can surely be questioned, as well as his bad taste in mocking grammatical errors and correspondence not meant for publication, but the historian must be grateful. In 1900, Prokopovich finally published something intentionally, a substantial study, over 300 pages, entitled The Worker Movement in the West, an Essay in Critical Investigation. This study of Germany and Belgium also had its publication ups and downs. Kuskova had returned to Russia in 1899 and smuggled in a manuscript of the book, but when Prokopovich himself returned to Russia, he was promptly arrested. The publisher, L. F. Penatelyev, decided he should play it safe and handed the manuscript over to the official censorship. The officials sat on it for another six months, but finally allowed publication in January 1900. According to Iskra No. 10, the book had at least one Russian fan, Sergei Zupitov, the police chief who tried to introduce legal anti-revolutionary trade unions, recommended Prokopovich's book to workers under his influence as an antidote to the more mainstream social democratic views. As we shall see, Zupitov had cause. A couple of cautionary remarks before proceeding. First, I am making the simplifying assumption that this body of writing all expresses the same set of views, despite the weird publication history and the double authorship, or triple, if we count the letter writer who describes Prokopovich's views. As a matter of fact, I do see some apparent minor differences between Kuskova and Prokopovich, but their basic unity of outlook is remarkable. Furthermore, it is unclear to what degree readers in 1901 understood that all this material came from the same source. In particular, Kuskova's authorship of the Kreda only became officially public knowledge when Kuskova herself announced the fact in 1906. Short-circuiting the spread of awareness Taken together, these writings constitute as concerted and slashing an attack on Erfurtianism as has ever been penned. Let us go through the checklist. Erfurt Allegiance Prokopovich's book explicitly attacks Kautsky, the Erfurt program, and the SPD model. Merger formula, good news, circles of awareness, and the ideal of an independent political class party. All explicitly repudiated. Political freedom. Kuskova and Prokopovich did not reject political freedom as a value, but they were certainly blasé about its importance and definitely argued that overthrowing the autocracy was not an urgent priority at the moment. Popular leadership and hegemony. Kuskova and Prokopovich thought that it was social democracy that needed to recognize society and abandon its outworn creed. Perhaps the two writers did not reject internationalism, I have found nothing to the contrary, but they did reject imitating alien models and in particular transferring the SPD model to Russia. And yet, Kuskova and Prokopovich still thought of themselves as social democrats. This is because they assumed that social democracy was itself rejecting the Erfurtian model of the past. They certainly were not tame disciples of Eduard Bernstein. They considered Bernstein as a useful but somewhat confused spokesman for a massive shift in party outlook. Indeed, Prokopovich criticizes Bernstein for spending too much time on correcting socialist doctrine, as if the party's actual practice was ever really guided by doctrine. 
What needs to be rejected, continues Prokopovich, is rather the mythical self-image of a party guided by doctrine. I myself am encouraged by the attack mounted by Kuskova and Prokopovich because it confirms not only the existence of Erfurtinism, but its basic contours as described here. I also agree with Prokopovich that his critique goes to the heart of the matter more incisively than Bernstein's. Instead of dithering on about whether small-scale agriculture was increasing or decreasing, Guskova and Prokopovich zeroed in on the social democratic narrative, on the very possibility of a class having an exalted historical mission, or of a party that brings insight to the wide masses. Prokopovich laughed at LaSalle's illusions on this score. The masses are not aware of any grand historical ideas that they are supposed to carry out, and indeed, are the masses even capable of striving in purpose of fashion to carry out such ideas? Erfurtians visualized their political strategy as a series of spreading circles of awareness, and their aim was to break down all barriers to this spread. Kuskova and Prokopovich tried in every possible way to subvert this scenario. First, they blocked the spread of awareness at the root by denying that the party program itself should contain anything but immediately realizable aims. The proletariat was not going to take power in the near future, and therefore, to put socialization of the means of labor into the program, or to talk about the Zukunftstadt, future state, is utopian and childish. In fact, even the SPD's minimum program, the so-called practical and non-socialist part of the program, was utopian as well, since many of the reforms were simply not acceptable to contemporary bourgeois society. The same reasoning applied to Russia. Since the actual overthrow of the autocracy was not on the immediate agenda, the demand for it should be removed from the social democratic program. Another barrier to the spread of awareness was set up by Prokopovich's idiosyncratic concept of propaganda versus agitation. The job of creating a new awareness of basic interests was left to propaganda, while agitation restricted itself to help in implementing interests of which the workers were already aware. But this meant that the mission by which social democracy defined itself, spreading awareness, should be confined to a small number of, it would seem, rather marginal individuals. Quote, Propaganda about the future, socialism, and all the rest of it, can, for the time being, serve as an excellent means for attracting individuals from the intelligentsia and from among the workers, in the majority of cases sentimental types who are not very purposive, but never the masses. End quote. The dismissive and all the rest of it is eloquent. In contrast, agitation among the masses of workers was in some way phony if revolutionary intellectuals were involved. Quote, just as economic agitation begins only when a strike movement begins by itself in the worker mass without the immediate participation of intellectuals, just so can political agitation be started when the workers themselves, without the revolutionary intellectuals, begin the struggle with the autocracy, end quote. Well, did Kuskova and Prokopovich have any conception of class leadership? Yes, and here is how it worked. The Social Democrats helped the masses organize on the basis of their perceived interests. Trying to increase the workers' insight into their own interests on a mass scale is impossible and undesirable. The job of the Social Democrat is thus to fight stihinist, that is to say, disorganization and indiscipline. As these mass organizations fight for worker interests, they will run into czarist repression, an experience that will broaden the worker's sense of their interests. Not agitation by the party, but life continually makes the workers aware of more and more new interests, since it develops in strict dependence on the conditions of time and place. The awareness of the masses renders fruitless all attempts to force, nasilovit, the natural course of the worker movement's development. Guskova and Prokopovich were not worried about domination of the workers by the revolutionary intellectuals, they just thought that trying to revolutionize minds on a mass scale was a plentiful waste of time. The phrase, revolutionizing minds, had been used by Kautsky to express the modus operandi of the party. Prokopovich sided with the revisionist leaders who mocked this phrase. For example, the German agrarian specialist Edward David responded as follows. Quote, we didn't obtain the sympathy of the masses in the way described by Kautsky, revolutionizing minds. We conquered the sympathy of the masses by practical activity that responded to the needs of the day. The revolutionizing of minds will get us only a few students. We can't get the sympathy of the masses by awakening hopes for the future in them, or by ideas that are not so easy to understand. The revolutionizing of the masses doesn't start from the mind, but from the stomach. End quote. Prokopovich records similar sentiments in the Belgian Worker Party that he and Kuskova saw as a model. 
One Bertrand asks, What is the reason for the success of the Worker Party up till now? The socialist ideal or our program of practical reforms? His answer is reforms, since the socialist ideal allures only the more enlightened and more intellectual part of the working class. More striking of all, Prokopovich summed up the general feeling of Belgian socialists in the following way. The masses are like children. Visual demonstration is what strikes them. Like children, the masses are allured only by immediate and current results, not by high abstract ideals. Erfurtian social democrats such as Plikhanov and Lenin also assume that life, in the form of the political obstacles experienced by workers in their economic struggle, would be an important source of increased class awareness. Who would be foolish enough to deny it? What struck them about the line of least resistance interpretation was, instead, that it relegated all political leadership to an unimportant superstructure. In his Vadimikum, Plikhonov responded that correct leadership could accelerate historical development, using a version of the sooner or later argument. Quote, The workers know only two things, their own clearly perceived concrete interest and their position among other classes. This also needs to be analyzed. Do the workers always know their own interests and their position among other classes? We, the partisans of the materialist view of history, believe the answer is far from always. We do not doubt that the awareness of the people is determined by their social existence. The appearance of new aspects of reality are the cause of a new content of awareness. But this determination of awareness by existence is an entire process that is completed in the course of a more or less extended period. For this reason, the workers do not always know their real interests. For this reason, for example, some German workers do not support the social democrats but the free thinkers, or the party of the center, or even the large-scale landowners. End quote. If the workers did not immediately or automatically perceive their true interests, then there was a role for what Prokopovich dismissively termed the revolutionary bacilli slash intellectuals. This term became something of a catchphrase. Lenin alludes to it in what is to be done. Plikhanov's comment brings out the essential disagreement. Quote, Mr. N.N., Prokopovich, wants to say that the awareness of the masses always falls behind the development of social relations. This is more or less correct. But the only logical conclusion that follows from this is that the revolutionary bacilli, it makes no difference whether these come from the intelligentsia or the workers, should use all means in their power to ensure that the awareness of the worker falls as little behind the development of the real relations of a given society. The task of the bacilli is precisely this, the further development of the self-awareness of the proletariat, end quote. At bottom, the issue was not for or against intellectuals. It was for or against inspired and inspiring leadership. Plikhanov saw the mission of social democrats as accelerating historical development by increasing class awareness, while Kuskova and Prokopovich worried about social democracy trying to force, or even violate, Nesilovot, the course of development. No wonder that Kuskova and Prokopovich scorned the Efertian ideal of inspired and inspiring leadership as futile self-deception. Any attempt at such leadership was equivalent to assuming the workers were dough that could be molded at will. It was knocking on the doors of closed hearts. Erfurtianism pro e contra. Parvus and Prokopovich. Prokopovich's big book on the European worker movement provoked a long review by Parvus a Russian-born social democrat who became a prominent spokesman of the left wing of the German Social Democratic Party. The review was published in the first issue of Zarya, the theoretical journal published by the Iskra group. Thus, we have a major debate between two informed Russians about the meaning and relevance of the SPD model. Perhaps nowhere else can we find the essential issues stated with such clarity and conviction. Prokopovich's history of German social democracy was a wholesale attack on the SPD model. His view of the party is well summed up by Timofey Kopelzon, one of the editors of Rabochi Diela, in a letter to Axelrod. Quote, For a person as gifted as Prokopovich, the path of criticism, the path of negation, is a path that is very rewarding, but it is also a very slippery path. In his criticism of the programs and the views set forth in the European social democratic literature, he positively does not leave stone on stone. He has a completely different view of the social democratic past from the one found in the German literature. The communism of Marx, the views of LaSalle, the tendencies of the 1848 revolution, all of these appear in a completely different light. End quote. In his review, 
Parvus described Prokopovich's views of the SPD present sarcastically but fairly accurately. Quote, The basic presuppositions of social democracy are mistaken. Its final goal is mistaken. Its entire theory is unscientific. There is not a grain of scientific value in it. Despite all this backwardness, fuzzy thinking, immaturity, contradictions, and nonsense, social democracy just keeps growing and growing. Why does it keep growing? Hard to say, since the conditions for social revolution have not matured, and indeed they never will mature, all of social democracy is just one big mistake. It should have been a bourgeois democratic party. It developed completely in the wrong direction. Old man history got all things screwed up. End quote. According to Prokopovich, party tactics follow the line of least resistance. They go where circumstances push them, not where party leaders want them to go. Official programs are thus self-deceiving myths. Prokopovich divided SPD history into three periods, and the men who symbolized the three periods, LaSalle, Kautsky, and Bernstein, actually had very little idea of what was really going on. We can paraphrase in the following way Prokopovich's account of SPD history. The founder of German social democracy, Ferdinand LaSalle, was essentially a Cataline, that is, a D-class A enthusiast who assumed that reforms were useless because the revolution was coming soon. Thence came his dismissal of the rest of society as one reactionary mass. Thence his contempt for trade unions and economic organizations in general. Thence came the whole idea of a separate worker party. But, in the LaSalle period, the workers were too undeveloped to be capable of anything much. They certainly had no role in obtaining political freedom. That was done by others. LaSalle was forced to use propaganda to tell the workers about the content of their interests, and thus was not in a position to use agitation to help them defend their interests, a stage that had already been reached by the workers in France and England, but not yet in Germany. Thus, LaSalle's attempt to create a class movement and to imbue it with a sense of mission was bound to end in failure. The most eloquent speech cannot create new deeds. Genuine political independence was also an illusion during this period. The workers had only the choice of whether to be the tail, that is, passively accept the leadership, of the liberals or of the conservatives, and unfortunately, LaSalle chose the conservatives, thus weakening the progressive opposition. He bequeathed to the party an erroneous belief in the cowardly German bourgeoisie, even though later capitalist development would make nonsense of this negative assessment. The spirit of the second period, 1867-90, to 90, is best summed up by the Erfurt program and Kautsky's commentary. Kautsky tried to tie the abstract final goals to concrete interests without much success. Prokopovich quotes some of the passages I used in Chapter 1 from Kautsky's Parliamentarism, in which Kautsky argues that great goals help unite the movement. Prokopovich just laughs, since Kautsky obviously had no idea of the real variety of interests within the worker class. Prokopovich gives his own sarcastic version of the merger formula. Quote, In the program of the party, we are evidently dealing with aims of two kinds. A. Aims that arise out of the immediate interests of the workers and that develop along with the growth of the economic strength of the working class. And B. Aims taken from without, izvinye, from the conclusions of social science and introduced, privnisunye, to the worker movement. End quote. What Kautsky thought of as a marriage made in heaven between socialism and the worker movement was, for Prokopovich, a shotgun wedding leading straight to divorce. The third period, 1890 to the time of writing in 1899, was a period when the party realized its own growing influence and integration into society, and therefore began to discard the baggage of hostility to society and of earlier dreams of revolution. Bernstein was the symbol of this change, but actually he was as deluded as LaSalle and Kautsky because he also thought that abstract principles determine tactics. Not theoreticians like Bernstein, but practical leaders like George Vollmer are the ones who are helping the party make the necessary adjustments and who propagate the new tactics. Of course, the struggle against outmoded principles does take time and effort, which is why putting principles into programs is a bad idea. This lag explains why the new outlook has not yet, in 1899, triumphed. But circumstances determine tactics, and the basic circumstance at present, the party's newfound strength, ensures a rapid victory of the new outlook. Prokopovich's all-out attack on the SPD model provoked Parvus's classic exposition and defense of it. 
For Parvus, the essence of social democratic tactics lies in the synthesis of reformism and revolutionism. The English workers were narrowly reformist, as yet they did not realize that a genuinely independent worker party was necessary, if for no other reason than to preserve parliament from degeneration. In contrast, the French workers were so disgusted with the bourgeois state that they remained stuck in pure revolutionism. They busied themselves in organizing the social revolutionary army of the proletariat, but they had nothing for this army to do. As a result, they did nothing more than oppose the democratic chatter of the bourgeois parliamentarians with chatter about social revolution. As opposed to either of these, the German model was based on using parliamentarism for revolutionary aims. Parvus was not advocating a cynical exploitation of an institution that would later be discarded, since the nature of parliament depended on the class nature of the state, and not the other way around. This meant that, quote, the capitalist character of the state is not changed in the slightest by the parliamentary growth of social democracy. The essential point is not a shift in the composition of parliament, but a redistribution of the political forces of the country. But this redistribution will find its final expression in the changed composition of parliament. Usually, this will be preceded by an epoch of political troubles, Schmuta. End quote. From Parvus's extensive description of how the SPD strategy works out in practice, I will concentrate on the SPD's role as tribune of the people and as leader in the fight to defend and extend democracy. The liberal bourgeois opposition in Germany is disheartened by social democracy's successful campaign to end the political dependence of the workers. It therefore inclines more and more to joining the reaction in a common crusade against social democracy. Quote, the result is that social democracy more and more becomes the only opposition party. As it fights in Parliament against the capitalist nature of government policy, against the exploitative strivings of the parliamentary majority, against the impotence and disingenuousness of the bourgeois opposition, it not only strengthens its position among the workers, but draws to its side the democratic elements of society. End quote. One way that a truly social democratic party exercises this strictly democratic leadership is to interest itself in everything happening around it. The final result is that in the whole wide world of political and social life, there is not one fact that does not sooner or later call for social democratic intervention. Everything, starting from major political shifts and ending with petty scandals, is transformed into a means of social revolutionary agitation. As we shall see, Parvus here expresses one of Lenin's key theses in what is to be done. Needless to say, Parvus rejects Prokopovich's picture of LaSalle as a romantic, self-deceiving dreamer. For Parvus, LaSalle was the practical politician par excellence. It was he who grasped the tactical implications of the Communist Manifesto and applied them to Germany by making the social revolutionary energy of the proletariat a political factor on a continuing day-to-day -day basis. No longer would the Revolutionary Party only emerge on days of revolution and then afterwards subside back to the quiet theoretical propaganda. In his very strong defense of LaSalle, Parvus particularly rebutted Prokopovich's charge that by breaking away from the Liberal Progressive Party, LaSalle had helped reactionary forces by undercutting bourgeois liberalism. On the contrary, LaSalle had awakened the workers to political life instead of leaving them in indifference and apathy. Quote, and this is a much greater bulwark of political freedom and democracy than any provided even by a liberal majority in parliament. Even apart from the social revolution, the fact that in Germany, the organized proletariat stands on guard for the constitution is the deed of social democracy, the deed of LaSalle, end quote. Since Prokopovich had no conception of the basic democratic synthesis of reform and revolution, he misinterpreted the events of the 1890s, the so-called post-Erfurtian period. Prokopovich saw any manifestation of reform activity as evidence of evolution away from an earlier pure revolutionism. He made his case by pointing to current SPD support of trade unions and the party's attempts to gain peasant support, but he did not realize that both of these efforts had a long past in social democratic activity. A further proof of the soundness of the social democratic synthesis is in the characteristic fact that, quote, all deliberate deviations from the policy we have described up till now suffered a complete fiasco. Deviations to the left lead to pure revolutionism and peter out into nothingness. Deviations to the right turn bit by bit into bourgeois radicalism and fuses with it. And indeed, present-day social democracy has no raison d'etre without the idea of social revolution. 
its continued separation from the democratic bourgeoisie becomes incomprehensible, end quote. Far from being rejected by the SPD itself, the logic of the German model was imposing itself elsewhere. The English workers were swiftly moving toward an independent worker party, while the French-style pure revolutionism was quietly evolving toward the German model. The policy of German social democracy is being deliberately taken over by the worker parties of the other countries. This would be an impossibility if this policy did not correspond to the general historical tasks of the class struggle of the proletariat. The debate between Prokopovich and Parvus about the German model confirms my description of the basic content of Erfurtianism and, even more important, my thesis that there was such a thing as Erfurtianism. The debate also shows that the clash between economist and orthodox in Russian social democracy was at heart a clash over the relevance of the SPD model. Prokopovich's critique zeroed in on the heart of this model, namely, the story the party told itself about its past, combined with its sense of mission about the future. Of particular interest is Prokopovich's sarcastic version of the merger formula that we quoted earlier. He contrasts the aims coming from the worker class to the aims brought in, privnisti, from without, izvinye. When Lenin uses almost the same words in an approving way, they are taken to be proof of his rejection of European Marxism and social democracy. Is it not more natural to see these terms as his affirmation of that model against attack? Let others take Prokopovich's advice and focus on the worker's stomach. He, Lenin, would continue to bring them the socialist good news that would revolutionize their minds. Erfurtianism as an Alien Importation it is now time to turn to the notorious program of the Kreda. Kuskova's Kreda is an application of Prokopovich's reading of Western social democracy to the situation in Russia. The formula that summed up this reading was tactics always followed the line of least resistance. In fact, circumstances determine tactics with the precision of an astronomer, thus rendering irrelevant all conscious tactical decisions of the leaders. In the case of German social democracy, circumstances had imposed a negative phase in which the proletariat opposed itself to society and dreamed of revolution, but circumstances had now changed, and the party was now in the process of recognizing society. In the case of Russia, the circumstances of czarist repression severely limited possibilities, so that the tactics imposed by the line of least resistance were meager indeed. Quote, in Russia, the line of least resistance will never lead in the direction of political activity. The incredible political repression compels us to talk a lot about politics and focus our attention precisely on this question, but it will never compel any sort of practical activity. In the West, the weak forces of the proletariat were strengthened and formed by being drawn into political activity. In Russia, in contrast, these weak forces stand before a wall of political repression. Not only are there no practical ways of fighting against this repression, and therefore no practical ways of developing, but even the weakest shoots of practical activity are systematically smothered and cannot grow. If you add to this that our worker class has not received the legacy of the organizational spirit that distinguished the fighters of the West, the resulting picture is depressing and capable of plunging the most optimistic Marxist, someone who believes that every additional factory smokestack brings great well-being, by the mere fact of its existence, into gloom. The economic struggle is difficult, infinitely difficult, but it is possible. It is indeed being carried out by the masses themselves getting used to organization by means of this struggle, and being pushed every minute up against the political regime, the Russian worker will finally create something we can call a form of worker movement, will create the organization or the organizations that best fit Russian conditions. At the present time, we can say with assurance that the Russian worker movement is still in an amoeba-like condition and has created no organizational form at all. The strike movement, which occurs at any level of organization, cannot yet be called a crystallized form of the Russian worker movement. Illegal organizations do not merit any attention from a purely quantitative point of view, not to speak of their usefulness under present conditions." End quote. What then did Kuskova think was possible in Russia under the autocracy? Some kind of non-political worker movement that would work out organizational forms that best fit Russian conditions and that would studiously avoid connections to any irrelevant revolutionary underground. What was impossible? A worker movement capable of fighting against political repression, much less revolutionary overthrow. Based on these premises, Kuskova sets out the following program of action. 
she does not herself say program, but quote, any talk about an independent worker political party is in essence nothing more than the product of the transfer of alien tasks, alien results onto our soil. The Russian Marxist is still a pitiful spectacle. The slightest attempt to concentrate attention on social manifestations of a liberal political nature calls forth the protest of orthodox Marxists, who forget that a whole series of historical conditions prevent us from being Marxists of the West, and demand from us another Marxism, appropriate and necessary for Russian conditions. For the Russian Marxist, there is only one conclusion— participation by helping the economic struggle of the proletariat and participation in liberal oppositional activity, end quote. In his Vedemikum, Plikhanov dotted the I's and crossed the T's about the political meetings of Kuskova's recommendations. In the absence of an independent political worker party, this kind of participation necessarily turns into a straightforward fusion with the radical and liberal bourgeoisie. In What is to be Done, Lenin summarizes, accurately enough, it seems to me, the program of the Kreda. Quote, Have the workers carry out the economic struggle. To speak more precisely, the Tredunyanya struggle, for this embraces a specific worker politics as well, and have the Marxist intellectual fuse with the liberals for a political struggle. End quote. Lenin is careful to underline that the economic struggle encompasses what we might now call interest group politics in contrast to regime change. A major part of his polemic throughout what is to be done is that his social democratic opponents had unwittingly embarked on a realization of the program of the Kreda. Lenin's comment, in which he says, in effect, that there is such a thing as economist politics brings up an important issue. What does it mean to say that the economists rejected political struggle? Guskova herself wrote in 1906 that any talk about the economists' principled refusal of political struggle is a despicable untruth that belongs to those political methods that so strongly compromise the Social Democratic Party. And Kuskova and Prokopovich did indeed think that political rights were very important and that organizing the worker movement would indirectly lead to genuine worker support for the expansion of political rights in Russia, since the workers would continuously be pushed up against their lack of political rights. Kuskova even writes elsewhere that one advantage of Russia over Western Europe is the white terror that the government directs against the workers, and that will swiftly purify their minds and will quickly place political interests among their real interests. Nevertheless, Kuskova and Prokopovich did strongly reject political struggle in the Russian or Fertian sense. First of all, any struggle for political rights would not be carried out by an independent worker political party. Vladimir Akimov, an editor of Rabochi Diela, who evidently knew Kuskova, summed up her views as follows. Quote, the author of the Kreda was an extreme political who maintained that the working class was not capable of overthrowing the autocracy, and therefore urged the socialists to look elsewhere, to look to the intelligentsia, for support in its struggle against the autocracy. End quote. Further, Kuskova made clear her feeling that a constitutional system was, in itself, no big prize. Kuskova pointed out that the reactionary bourgeoisie in the constitutional West was making workers fear for their established rights. The Russian bourgeoisie would certainly learn from their Western colleagues. Thus, it is utopian to think the overthrow of the autocracy would cause the Russian bourgeoisie to change the political position of the workers. One must not expect any particular benefit from a constitution in Russia. Prokopovich and Kuskova were also dead set against any agitation aimed at the overthrow of the autocracy. Propaganda on this subject was acceptable, because propaganda was, by definition, impractical and aimed at marginal individuals. But, since agitation was always a call to action, and since a call for immediate attack on the autocracy could only end in a bloodbath, it followed that Russian social democrats should fear political agitation worse than any provocateur. Not even the party program should mention a direct political struggle within the autocracy. In the interests of the future political struggle, we must avoid with all our strength a parody of it at the present time. The effort to foist a program of revolutionary overthrow on the worker movement was deemed wrong-headed, not because it stymied worker self-activity, as implied by Kuskova in 1906, but because it was futile. According to Prokopovich, revolutionary democratic intellectuals, such as Plikhanov and Axorod, looked around after the defeat of Narodnaya Volia for some real force that would help them attain their aims. 
and they settled on the worker movement and tried for 15 years to foist their program of political freedom via revolutionary overthrow on the workers. They had never succeeded, and they never would. Quote, At the same time that the emancipation of labor groups strives with its typical energy toward a direct struggle with the government, our Russian comrades, with their indifferent attitude toward politics, have for a long time carried out an indirect struggle with the autocracy. There are no loud triumphs in this struggle, no noisy battles. It is the work of the mole that undermines the very foundations of the existing political order. Which side claims our just sympathies? The side of the commanders without armies who do not know the paths that lead to the desired goal and who have over the course of a decade and a half tirelessly waved a paper sword? Or the side of the humble activists who toil on without noisy publicity from day to day doing the job that needs to be done? End quote. Prokopovich's accusation that the emancipation of labor group wanted to exploit the worker movement in order to fulfill the dreams of the democratic intelligentsia about political freedom is still influential among scholars today. We should therefore note that it is the opposite of the truth. Plikhanov and Axelrod were not advocates of political freedom who decided that the workers would be good revolution fodder, but rather socialist revolutionaries who only adopted the watchword of political freedom after they were convinced that it was in the interests of the workers. It is an unfortunate oversimplification to say that the economists rejected all political struggle on principle. Nevertheless, it hardly advances matters simply to correct this oversimplification by stating the economists did support political struggle and leave it at that. The Russian Erfurtians had a vision, squarely based on the SPD model, of an independent worker political party leading the struggle for the democratic transformation of Russia. Kuskova and Prokopovich were fervently opposed to this vision and built up an impressive case against it. What Alexander Potrosov, an Iskra editor who was later on the right wing of Menshevism, wrote in 1909 about economism in general applies with particular force to Kuskova and Prokopovich. Economism was the product of a disenchantment with the workers and with their primitiveness, stichinost, and meager purposiveness of the strike movement. This concrete movement of the concrete proletariat did not square with its assigned historical mission of universal liberation. As Kuskova truly said in the Kreda, the picture that she and Prokopovich painted was depressing and capable of plunging the most optimistic Marxist into gloom. The Russian immigre Kopilson, who had talked with Prokopovich, noted his conviction that to talk to the worker mass in Russia about the abolition of capitalism, about socialism, and indeed about the abolition of the autocracy is in general absurd and an unproductive waste of forces. The couple felt that Russian social democrats had deceived themselves by a schematic application of the path of development in the West to our situation. They explicitly noted their distance from some of the arguments of the Communist Manifesto. If this work is taken as a gospel, then our point of view is heresy. For Lenin, the Communist Manifesto was indeed the gospel, Evangelia, of international social democracy. The history of the Western European worker movement, as presented by Kautsky, remained Lenin's basic source of inspiration. He stoutly maintained that talking to the Russian workers about socialism and about the abolition of the autocracy was the most productive use of available forces. Lenin was one Russian social democrat who refused to be plunged into gloom. Thus we can see why the accusation of implementing the program of the Kreda was just about the most serious one that Lenin could fling at any social democrat. Rabochia Musi Rabochia Musi, worker thought, was a St. Petersburg underground newspaper that began publication in 1897 and managed to put out 16 numbers by the time of its final issue in late 1902. This five-year run is an impressive one, as underground newspapers go. Iskra itself only lasted five years altogether, although it published many times more issues. Rabochia Musi billed itself as the voice of the Petersburg workers. Starting with the fifth issue in early 1899, it was also the official organ of the St. Petersburg Social Democratic Committee, the Union of Struggle a status in possible conflict with the aspiration to be the voice of the workers. Indeed, along with the Kreda, Rabochia Musi soon became a symbol of extreme economism. In what is to be done, Lenin does not really polemicize with Rabochia Musi, 
Rather, he uses it as a well-known exemplar of economism and then attempts to demonstrate that Rabochi Diela, his real target, is following in the dreaded path of Rabochi Amusi. Why was Rabochi Amusi so unpopular in orthodox social democratic circles? Our answer to this question is crucial to our interpretation of what is to be done. There are two approaches to Rabochi Amusi, divided by the key issue of whether the newspaper spoke with one voice or with many voices. If the newspaper spoke with one voice, then the views of the editorialists should be considered the views of at least some of the St. Petersburg workers. In this case, Lenin's attack on Rabochia Musi betrays his anxiety about the outlook of the workers themselves, a conclusion that fits in nicely with the textbook interpretation. If, on the contrary, many conflicting views can be found jostling side by side on the pages of the newspaper, then this conclusion need not follow. The claim that Rabochia Musi spoke with one voice goes back to a 1904 party history by a former member of Rabochi Diela editorial board, Vladimir Akimov, who argued that Russian Social Democrats were hostile precisely because Rabochia Musi was a worker newspaper. Quote, For decades, the Russian socialists sought to make the workers think for themselves, and gradually the mind of the worker came to life. At last, on the peripheries of Russia, in Vilna and Petersburg, the worker managed in the same year to create their own newspapers, Arbita Stima and Rabochia Musi. The Jewish Intelligente, Social Democrats, caught the voice of the workers, supported it, made it loud, strong, and glorious. But it was actually the orthodox wing of the revolutionary Social Democrats that ridiculed and condemned the thinking of the worker. True, his ideas were untutored, clumsy, unsubtle. Nevertheless, it is a matter for rejoicing that there were social democrats, economists, in Petersburg who supported and served those workers who fought for themselves. For this, they should be forgiven all the errors that were forced upon them on this difficult road. End quote. Akimov saw Iskra as the inheritor of this arrogant attitude toward actual workers. He cites a case where Iskra ridiculed a letter by workers as illiterate. The same basic approach is found in the works of Alan K. Wildman, author of the only detailed study in Western scholarship of Rabochia Musi. Wildman argues that Rabochia Musi had a consistent message. Quote, Despite the variety of sentiments which found refuge on the pages of Rabochia Musi, a consistent line of thought threaded its way through the successive issues and underlay the spirit of the whole enterprise. This way of thinking squarely opposed, both in letter and spirit, the mainstream of Russian social democracy, from the theoretical precepts of its founders to the workday philosophy of its underground practitioners in Russia. End quote. The content of Rabochia Musi's message was the workers' bid for self liberation. Wildman, followed on this point by Reginald Zelnick and Gerald Sir, draws the conclusion that Lenin's hostility to the workers' drive for self-liberation is the key to Lenin's worry about the workers. By the end of the 1890s, Lenin, as Zelnick puts it, quote, had learned from afar that some of Russia's most militant, dedicated workers were now engaged in the dramatic, though in some ways ambivalent, rejection of intelligentsia tutelage, a worker-file trend that echoed trends in other parts of Europe, and one that Lenin fought with all his heart, end quote. Thus, in Sir's words, what Lenin called economism was in actuality the trend among workers in the 1890s to seek control of their own party organizations. Since he himself was committed to an elitist conception of intelligentsia hegemony in the revolutionary party, Lenin could not but be opposed to such a trend. What is to be done was designed to be Lenin's heavy artillery in his campaign to systematically exclude workers from leadership positions. The alternative view, that Rabochia Musi spoke with many voices, also goes back to some of the newspaper's first social democratic readers. Among these early readers were Plikhanov and his associates in the Emancipation of Labor Group, starting in 1898. Many of the writers associated with Rabochi Diela also started in 1898, Lenin, starting in 1899, and M. Lyadov in his Party History of 1906, where he explicitly challenges Akimov. Remarkably enough, included in this group is K.M. Taktarev, one of the main editors of Rabochia Musi, in his 1902 history and defense of the newspaper. We also have evidence of private reactions by a number of observers. These readers encompass a wide range of social democratic opinion, and also a wide range of attitudes toward Rabochia Musi. Some are hostile to it, Lyadov, some defensive, Taktarev, and some are trying their best to say something nice, Rabochi Diela. 
The basic consensus in their reactions is therefore quite striking. As opposed to Akimov and Wildman, all these writers insist on a separation between the voices of the workers writing in the pages of Rabotche Musi and the voices of the editorialists. They are all dissatisfied with the voices of the editorialists, asserting that the editorialists had no particular right to speak in the name of the Petersburg workers, and that their views went beyond the pale of Russian social democracy. After listening to all sides, going through the issues of Rabotche Musi, and assimilating the valuable factual material assembled by Wildman, I believe the second approach is the most convincing. The Akimov-slash-Wildman tradition has overestimated the unity of the newspaper's voice, and underestimated the offensiveness to any social democrat of many of the views set forth by the editorialists. As far as Lenin is concerned, his opposition to Rabotia Musi arose out of genuine programmatic differences, and not out of hostility to a worker bid for self-liberation. Lenin's hostility to Rabotia Musi's editorial stand belongs to a consensus that includes staunch Iskra foes such as Rabotchi Diela and even, from his 1902 vantage point, the writer of many of the offending editorials, K. M. Taktarev. Three lines of evidence support these conclusions. The first is information about who actually controlled the newspaper. The second is the conflicting views that found expression in Rabotia Musi. And the third is the consensus of informed social democratic readers. We shall examine these three lines of evidence in turn. The Auspices of Rabotia Musi We are interested only in the first eight issues of Rabotia Musi's 16-issue run since these early issues are the ones that led to controversy and scandal in social democratic ranks. Who controlled the content of the newspaper during this period? For whom did it claim to speak? We have to answer these questions issue by issue because the auspices under which the newspaper came out kept changing. I will give the date of each issue and then explain the circumstances under which it was composed. Issue number 1, October 1897, and issue number 2, December 1897. These first two issues were the creation of a group of St. Petersburg workers along with some sympathetic intellectuals. These issues did not have a wide circulation, and in fact, they are no longer extant. We have access to some of their contents only to the extent that writers such as Taktarev and Lyadov reprinted materials from these issues. Issue number three, July 1898. Owing to arrests, the original St. Petersburg worker group behind Rabotia Musi ceased to exist after the second issue. A newly constituted group was composed mostly of intellectuals. Rabotia Musi would probably have ceased publication at this point, but salvation came from an unexpected quarter. An individual by the name of Carl August Koch, who might best be described as an intellectual of worker origin, arrived from Berlin and offered to publish Rabotia Musi abroad. Cook was Estonian-born in the Caucasus, who had traveled throughout Russia and immigrated to Berlin in the mid-1890s. As far as I can tell, he had no Petersburg roots prior to his contact with the reconstituted group in 1898. From issue number three on, Rabotia Musi was published abroad, a situation that sometimes led to conflict. Issue number four, October 1898. Starting with this issue, K. M. Taktarev joined the Emigre editorial group. Taktarev had immigrated from St. Petersburg some time previously. He was introduced to Cook by Elena Kuskova, the author of the Kreda. Kuskova herself felt that Cook was too anti-intellectual. The editorial articles in issue number four first excited hostility to Rabotia Musi from other social democrats. Issue number five, January 1899, and issue number six, April 1899. Issues number five and six marked a crucial change in the status of Rabotia Musi. Owing to negotiations among St. Petersburg groups, Rabotia Musi now became the official journal of the local Social Democratic Committee. Since Rabotia Musi was now the most authoritative voice of social democracy from within Russia, all social democratic activists had even more reason to be interested in the content of its editorials. The immediate result of the new situation was conflict between the St. Petersburg group, now a combination of the reconstituted Rabotia Musi group and the Social Democratic Union of Struggle, and Cook over the editorial content. The fifth issue was held back by a local group because they did not like Cook's editorials, and the sixth issue had no lead editorial. Issue number seven, July 1899, and a separate supplement in September 1899. 
While number seven was being prepared, arrests destroyed the Petersburg reconstituted group and much of the Social Democratic Committee. The foreign editorial board decided to go ahead with the publication of prepared material, plus adding some editorials without sanction from the now non-existent Petersburg group. The same can be said for the 36-page separate supplement published in September 1899, which was completely theoretical, learned, non-worker production. Issue number eight, February 1900. After the separate supplement, arguments arose about how to deal with the absurdity of a paper that claimed to be the voice of St. Petersburg workers, yet was published under the exclusive control of a foreign editorial board. Furthermore, the St. Petersburg Social Democrat Apolinaria Yakubova, Taktarev's future wife, arrived in Europe from Russia and objected to Cook's anti-intelligentsia outlook. Quote, A.A. Yakubova, although she defended the independent significance of worker organizations and the entry of workers into the central groups of our social democratic organizations on the basis of equality with the intellectuals, was nevertheless very much opposed to the tendency represented by Cook. End quote. The result was a chaotic issue number eight. On page eight of this issue appeared the following comment. All pamphlets and numbers three, four, five, six, and seven and the first four pages of number eight of Rabotia Musi were published with P. Petrov, Cook, as chief editor. Starting from page five of number eight, the newspaper appears under a new editorial board. The editors also profusely apologized for a particular article in the separate supplement that had managed to offend just about everybody in the Russian revolutionary movement. Certainly, issue number eight did not seem a very professional affair. At this point, midway in its career, we can take leave of Rabotia Musi. A worker organization was soon thereafter founded in Petersburg that was eventually able to take over editorial functions. The editorial stance grew more political and revolutionary in line with the times. Taktarev himself engineered this change of direction in early 1900. In what is to be done, Lenin made clear that his critique did not refer to the current Rabotia Musi. This history shows that editorial control of Rabotia Musi was never firm or stable. In Petersburg, we have the original Borabocia Musi group, the reconstituted group, and the Social Democratic Committee. All of these groups were severely damaged by arrests. Abroad, we have Cook, who subsequently co-opted Taktarev and then was forced to hand over editorial control to him. There were conflicts and confusion within the local groups in St. Petersburg, within the foreign editorial board, and between the local groups and the emigres. These conflicts showed up very visibly in the newspaper itself. After the first two issues, the editorial voice came mainly from abroad. Neither Cook nor Taktarev had any particular claim to speak for the Petersburg workers. As noted earlier, Cook had no prior Petersburg roots, although he did travel incessantly between Berlin and Petersburg when he was editor. Taktarev, although an intellectual born and bred, had hands-on experience in the Petersburg Social Democratic Underground. But as we shall see, the views he expressed immediately upon immigration from Russia were quite different from those he expressed in his later Rabotia Musi editorials. He changed his outlook under the impact of his work in the Belgian worker movement, as well as his interest in academic sociology. The Many Voices of Rabotia Musi It is now time to listen more closely to the different voices of Rabotia Musi. The distinctive voices include worker contributors, worker letters, editorials in issue number one, short editorials in issues four to eight, and Taktarev editorials in number four, number seven, and the separate supplement. The heart of Rabotia Musi and the cause of its success among the workers was the contribution from worker correspondence describing factory conditions and economic struggle. Unfortunately, this commentary must restrict its attention to abstract programmatic questions, and so I refer the reader to Wildman's study for more discussion of the worker contributions. Important for our arrangement here is that in these contributions we find no explicit statements of worker resentment toward intellectuals or any considered rejection of the need for the revolutionary overthrow of Tsarism. Worker contributors also revealed their hopes for what I will call the de facto tolerance strategy that was set out in elaborate form in some of the editorials as discussed below. Distinct from the factory correspondence were workers who sent in letters to comment on the newspaper or to urge revolutionary action, since the letter writers were often advanced workers in the social democratic sense. For example, a large group of political exiles wrote a letter that hailed the struggle for improved living standards, buit, 
for political freedom, for the final liberation of the worker class from all oppression. Down with despotism, long live the 1st of May, long live international social democracy. Ironically, these worker letters sometimes contained criticism of Rabocio Musi for being overly intellectual and over the heads of ordinary workers. The same kind of criticism later leveled at Iskra. A letter from a worker practique criticized the paper because of its evident desire to be a scientific organ devoted to heavy-duty thinkers such as Marx and Chernevsky. The many foreign words in the articles were comprehensible only to a worker aristocracy. The ordinary worker was left baffled, and all this in his own organ, one that calls itself worker thought. Worker practique called for living words, evocations of heroism, including romantic heroes such as Vera Perovskaya of Narodnaya Volia fame. Quote, You will see that the worker is not simply a worker, someone who needs a crust of bread, but is also a decent human being who has the sense of duty of the citizen and the self-sacrificing nature of the member of the intelligentsia. End quote. Recall that Akimov blamed Iskra for sneering at the illiteracy of its worker critics. Alas, this failing was not unique to Iskra. Rabocio Musi reacted badly to the letter from Worker Praktik. It mocked the author for a factual mistake, the Narodnaya Volia heroine was Sofia, not Vera, Perovskaya, and complained that he himself did not express himself very comprehensibly. Typical put-downs of workers by intellectuals. We now move on to the editorial voices that constituted the real source of irritation with Rabocio Musi. We start with the two lead editorials in issue number one. These editorials represent the voice of the original Rabocia Musi group before the foreign editorialists came on board. One of the editorials was written by a worker, V. Polyakov, and the other by an intelligent, N. A. Bogoroz, although, of course, this was not known at the time. In fact, owing to the limited circulation of these issues, these editorials only became known when reprinted elsewhere. The Intelligentsia editorial was reprinted in 1898 with an article about Rabocia Musi written by the émigré Vladimir Ivanshin. The worker editorial became available only after it was reprinted by Takterev in his 1902 book, that is, after Lenin's What is to be Done. Thus, Lenin's view of Rabocia Musi prior to 1902 was unaffected by the worker editorial. As Takterev said in 1902, the two editorials leave quite different impressions. The Intelligentsia editorial, in issue number one, established the profile of Rabocia Musi in social democratic circles. Lenin uses it as a target in what is to be done, and as we shall see, he was far from the first to subject the editorial to withering criticism. A full translation of this short editorial is given in the appendix to this chapter. The central point of the editorial was that the average worker will not be passionately involved in the movement until he is fighting for everyday economic interests. Whatever the merit of this point, the editorialists defended it in a way that was bound to put everybody on edge. What had earlier prevented the movement from engaging the workers on the basis of their economic interest? The repentant intelligent who devoted himself to the movement only for personal psychological reasons. The irrelevance and lack of influence of the isolated intelligentnya workers who were the only ones capable of true dedication for non-economic reasons. The preoccupation with the political idea, that is, with the importance of political freedom. These obstacles were only removed when the workers asserted control of their own fate by tearing their fate out of the hands of the leader guides, that is, social democratic intellectuals. When the editorialist looked ahead, he still did not forecast any useful role for non-repentant intellectuals, or for advanced workers in leadership positions, or for a commitment to political freedom on the part of average workers. Perhaps he wanted to say all these things, but he forgot to say so. Rather, he forecast a continually expanding worker movement that moved from success to success with no evident need for sacrifices or revolutionary battle. Quote, now, of course, no one will doubt that the man in the blue uniform, the gendarme, will not hold back the worker movement's gradual and undeviating development. In this struggle, every step forward is an improvement in one's life and a new means for further victories. End quote. Kautsky, as we recall, argued that a sense of historical mission would preserve the worker movement during inevitable defeats in periods of depression. In contrast, the Rabocio Musi editorialist is so confident that such defeats will not occur 
that he seems actually hostile to the idea of workers doing things for future generations. Quote, Let the workers conduct their struggle, knowing that they are not fighting for just some kind of future generation, but for themselves and their children. Let them remember that every victory, every foot of ground taken from the enemy, is one more step in the ladder leading to their personal well-being. Victory is ahead, and the workers will only win when their watchword is workers for the workers. End quote. What is striking about this editorial is the confidence and steady improvement in the worker condition and the uninterrupted expansion of the worker movement. Lyotov's comment sums up the Erfurtian response. When Lyotov wrote this in 1906, he only guessed, on the basis of its style and outlook, that the editorial was written by an intellectual. Quote, After liberating themselves from their previous leader guides, the workers were supposed to liberate themselves as well from the ideology of these leader guides, and to abdicate from the struggle for future generations, and go to prison, and exile, go hungry during strikes, die, in times of government pacification. And all of this in the name of an immediate improvement of their personal well-being. Only a semi-educated intellectual who fancied himself the interpreter of the will and desires of the workers could attribute to the workers this absurd and low-minded point of view. End quote. We turn now to the worker editorial from issue number one. The key contrast between this editorial and the Intelligentsia editorial just discussed is precisely the sense of historical mission. The worker editorialist's sense of empowerment is expressed in Lasallian language. He may have been one of the Petersburg workers mentioned by Takhtarev who were excited by Lasalle's ideas. Quote, Our historic position as the worker class is such that at the same time that we are working to achieve our own well-being, we are also fulfilling work for society. We are the last class. After us, there is no one. The domination of the worker class is universal domination, or better, universal equality of rights, and we should strive to achieve this. Only then can we say that we have not lived in vain, and our children will affirm this. End quote. In contrast to the Intelligentsia editorial, this writer believes that today's workers should think of future generations. Our children should be read in a wide sense. Perhaps as a consequence, there is no trace in this editorial of hostility between intellectuals and workers. True, the editorialist insists that the improvement of our position as workers depends upon ourselves, but this dictum is aimed at the capitalists and not at the intellectuals. The editorialist goes on to explain that isolated individual efforts will fail, and that the workers must stand together. Workers in different factories should think of themselves as one class and not accept the prevailing fragmentation. Quote, This fragmentation is not without consequences. One result is that worker circles who have lost their leader guide search for the restoration of new ties through comrades in other factories, while all the time they could have renewed them through someone no further away than a workshop in the same factory. In the same way, I have come across comrades who organized into a group who remained off by themselves and did not know how to attach themselves to the local social democratic committee and receive books. End quote. This editorialist does not dismiss the political ideal, nor does he look forward to continuous economic improvement. He tells his readers that the law in autocratic Russia is one link in the chain that binds them, since the capitalist and the government stand together. We are all fettered by a single chain of arbitrary abuse that we can only break apart by pooling our strength. We see before us the gloomy wall of the monarchy that prevents our access to the light. The power of autocratic lawlessness is so great that it can only be defeated by a united worker class, strong in the awareness of its independence. The worker editorialist is not Erner Fertian, but, on the crucial question, the sense of historical mission, he certainly can be called a proto-Erfurtian. He does not call for a revolutionary party to overthrow the autocracy, but he also makes no complaints about intellectuals who obsess about political freedom. No monumental change of circumstances would be required to convince this editorialist that the overthrow of the autocracy had to be a priority task. At the very least, then, these two voices of the original Rabocia Musi group differ in their tone of voice and their imagery. No doubt, 
Dr. Ev was right to regret that the Intelligentsia editorial was the one that came to be seen as the banner statement of the newspaper. Another of the many voices of Rabocio Musi finds expression in a number of short editorial statements in issues 4 to 8 that respond to criticisms of Rabocio Musi's position. These truculent statements seem to go out of their way to be insulting while, at the same time, avoiding any real discussion of the issues. They were instrumental in alienating the rest of social democracy from Rabocio Musi. The author of these shorter editorials is not known. The obvious candidates are Cook, Taktarev, or both. I wanted to believe that the author was Cook, since in quality they are a cut below Taktarev's larger editorials. But there is some indication that Taktarev might indeed be responsible, and I now lean towards this position. If so, Taktarev, rather than, as Wildman asserts, Cook, was responsible for setting the basic tone of the newspaper after Taktarev joined in issue number four. No doubt, however, the two men agreed on basic outlook. I will discuss these short editorials in more detail in the following section on reader response to Rabocio Musi. Rabocio Musi's most elaborate programmatic statements came from the pen of K.M. Taktarev. His two substantive lead articles in issue number 4 and 7, plus the 15-page article Our Reality in the separate supplement, constitute an ambitious effort to present and defend a course of action for Russian social democracy. The separate supplement as a whole sparked off the most extensive of Lenin's 1899 protest writings, A Retrogressive Tendency in Russian Social Democracy, see chapter 2. I find Taktarev's basic beliefs hard to pin down. When Taktarev immigrated from Russia in the mid-1890s, no one would have suspected that he would turn out to be the theoretician of Rabocio Musi. In fact, the Pilkonov group was extremely encouraged by his first-hand account of the strike movement in Petersburg, and especially by his views that these strikes represented the first major step in Russia toward the long-awaited merger. The Emancipation of Labor Group published an article by him on the subject, which reads like a pan to Russian Ofertianism. Quote, Arising in isolated circles of intellectuals and workers, Russian social democracy becomes a mighty force only when it fuses its intentions and ideals into one unbreakable intellectual and class movement, along with the immediate demands and needs of the Russian worker. The mass movement of the workers and the Russian social democratic organizations had been isolated, one from the other, before the big St. Petersburg strike. What was new in that strike was the link between the Russian worker mass and the social democratic movement. End quote. Doktorev was also completely loyal to Pekhanov's hegemony scenario. Quote, the Russian worker movement, thoroughly imbued with social democratic ideas, is the first and foremost force that with its uninterrupted development will overthrow the existing political system in Russia. Every Russian person will help to move forward the great cause of the whole nation the conquest of political freedom, end quote. This article, published in 1897 prior to the existence of Rabocio Musi, strengthened the faith of the Plikhanov group in their anti-economism. Taktarev obviously changed his mind. What happened? In immigration, Taktarev left the Russian milieu and became much more involved in the Belgian and English worker movements. This led him to reject the SPD model and consequently, as he himself well understood, mainstream Russian social democracy. In the 1920s, he wrote that, quote, The Russian social democratic movement, just like the English movement of the Chartists and the German social democratic movement, was to a significant extent the merger of a mass worker movement with a movement of an intelligentsia that was inclined to revolution, and that strove to become the head of the worker movement and to guide it, to a significant extent, in order to accomplish its own political strivings, end quote. In later conversations with Lenin in London, Taktarev realized that the root of their disagreement was that Lenin regarded the German Social Democratic Party as a model worker class party. I hope that the reader notices that this first-hand account confirms the basic thesis of this commentary. Following a hint of M. Lyadov and his party history of 1906, we may see a final influence on Taktarev emanating from the optimistic hopes of the Petersburg workers themselves about the possibility of a large-scale worker organization in autocratic Russia. Taktarev was aware of these hopes through written submissions to Rabocio Musi, not direct contact with the workers. In the late 1890s, an economic upswing and the novelty of the worker movement created a situation in which illegal strikes were tolerated and successful. 
To many workers, it seemed as if this situation would continue indefinitely and permit the worker movement to expand and grow strong within the framework of czarist absolutism. Temporary strike committees would turn into permanent militant unions. Strike funds would become the basis for large-scale organizations built from below. A worker cited by Takhtarev puts the case thus, Are not strikes forbidden, and yet nevertheless occur more and more often? And are not strikes really the same things as a militant union? Only the latter is permanent. And therefore do we need to worry over much about official prohibition of trade unions? Other worker correspondents in Rabochio Musi expressed the same outlook. One worker writes that the bigger and wider our worker strikes, the weaker and more cowardly become our enemies. Another worker exhorts his fellows, quote, Nothing can be dangerous for us if we hold on to our fellows and stand together like one man, because in that case our word alone is equivalent to action. Then there won't be enough prisons or gallows to stop us, and besides, there won't be anybody to carry out the orders. Even our enemies will cross over to our side, since the majority of them are the kind of people who side with the strongest. End quote. A third sums up, As soon as we fuse together, splatimsa, into one army, there will be no more sorrow and need. In other words, if the workers stand together, and what is to prevent them from doing just that, their enemies will fold. These expectations form the basis of what I call the de facto tolerance strategy. The worker movement could continue to expand and organize without revolutionary overthrow of czarism, indeed without any de jure removal of legal prohibition of worker strikes and unions. And its hopes for a revolutionary outcome solely by means of a militant worker movement, the de facto tolerance strategy might be compared to European syndicalism, except that the syndicalists expected and perhaps even looked forward to a bloody struggle, while these Russian workers wanted to avoid bloodshed and seemed woefully unprepared to confront determined opposition and repression. In his editorials, Tukhtarev provided a theoretical rationale for this optimistic outlook by claiming that custom, abuchi, was the basis of law, so that de jure legalization was unnecessary. In one of his editorials, Tukhtarev stated and then responded to the obvious objection that autocratic repression would stifle the growth of the worker movement. Quote, Russian law still does not acknowledge any right of the workers to establish unions for the improvement of their position. Russian law, so far, only acknowledges the right of workers to establish peaceful mutual aid societies. But, life itself, with the greatest possible insistence, compels the workers to establish militant strike unions for raising wages, shortening working hours, and so on. And until our law acknowledges the right to the official existence of this kind of union, these unions, as was the case everywhere abroad, will exist secretly. Worker unions are at first everywhere persecuted, then they are tolerated, then they become customary, then openly and officially acknowledged by the law, and finally, they are protected by the law. End quote. Takhtarev elaborated the de facto tolerance strategy into a more explicitly anti-political message than one finds in the worker contributors. Expanded political rights are no doubt a good thing, but there is no need to get obsessed about it. To fixate on a non-existent parliament instead of using existing representative bodies is revolutionary nihilism. Fighting the political police is a side issue of concern only to the revolutionary intelligentsia. Both these comments particularly enraged Lenin, as shown by his 1899 protest as well as by what is to be done. But political freedom is not something one fights for. It just happens as the worker movement gets stronger and more recognized. Quote, No, we've had enough of the lie that the worker movement develops because political freedom is already available. No, real freedom develops because the worker movement starts moving and cannot be held back by its striving ahead. The truth is that every strike, every worker fund, every worker union only becomes legal when it has already become a matter of custom, when it makes not the slightest bit of difference whether it is allowed or forbidden. The actual law is only a registration of contemporary, everyday, mutual estate class relations. The force of the law is the force of custom. If you can make something customary, then you have made it legal. End quote. It follows from the de facto tolerance strategy that there is no particular need for a revolutionary political party. Dr. Rev does not so much polemicize against the idea of a party as ignore its existence. 
His attention is exclusively focused on the worker movement, and since it is obvious that the worker movement cannot overturn the autocracy on its own, and also that it does not need to overthrow it in order to expand and accomplish its political purposes, then why talk about revolutionary overthrow? The worker movement definitely has political tasks, but these tasks, worker protection legislation and specific political rights, can be accomplished under the autocracy. The worker movement can also team up with various elite groups fighting for their interests, since the autocracy is hostile to any independent social activity. Dr. Rev summed up in a passage that became notorious. Quote, What is the struggle that it is desirable that the workers conduct? Isn't it the struggle that is the only possible one to conduct under the given circumstances? And isn't it the possible one in the present circumstances, that very struggle that they are conducting in actuality at the given moment? And it is to this struggle, the particular and the political struggle for the improvement of their position, that we call the workers. By particular struggle, we understand the struggle the workers conduct with their bosses, with their particular interests in view, for the improvement of their particular position. We call political struggle the struggle that the workers carry out for the improvement of their common position, having in view the improvement of the position of all workers. End quote. I believe that Takhtarev meant this conclusion to be an empirical one. The present worker movement is, in fact, the best one under present Russian circumstances. But this passage certainly reads as an almost philosophical statement. Whatever is, is right. As such, it is scornfully rejected in what is to be done. Takhtarev's definition of political struggle illustrates what Lenin, in what is to be done, called Tered Unyanya's politics, as opposed to the social democratic politics that was aimed at revolutionary overthrow of czarism on the basis of the interests of society as a whole. Reader Reaction We now turn to the history of the social democratic reaction to Rabocha Musi. For our purposes, this reaction is just as important as what Rabocha Musi was actually saying, perhaps more so. The timing of the reaction also helps establish just what it was about Rabocha Musi that everybody found so offensive. The reaction to the first two issues of the newspaper was highly positive. Vera Zasulich of the Emancipation of Labor Group was the first to record her response, although she had only seen issue number two. The editorials in issue number one might have cooled her enthusiasm. She wrote in 1898, by mistake, Zasulich thought that part of issue number two was a separate newspaper titled Boiba, or Struggle. Quote, We wish yet again the widest possible development for this purely worker literature, of which Rabocha Musi and Boiba are model examples. If accounts of strikes were written by participants who can write as well as the correspondent of Boiba, then in their descriptions, every strike would have its own particular character, precisely because the authors would give us not only the facts, but their own impressions of the facts. Newspaper correspondents of this kind would acquaint us not only with the general course of struggle, but also with the mental and moral profile of the fighters. End quote. Vladimir Ivanchin, later an editor of Rabochi Diela, was also enthusiastic. He heartily praised the appearance of the first Russian worker paper, as a sign that the Russian worker movement was alive and thriving. He also reprinted one of the two editorials in issue number one. In the long run, this turned out to be a disservice to Rabochi Musi, since otherwise the offensive editorial would never have attracted notoriety, given the extreme rarity of copies of the first issue. Lenin used Ivanchin's text for his critique of what is to be done. Despite his welcoming tone, Ivanshin struck a note that became more and more forceful in reactions to Rabocha Musi. Quote, Our task is to acquaint the reader with Rabocha Musi only in general terms, and therefore we cannot go into a detailed analysis of the article just printed, the Intelligentsia article from Rabocha Musi No. 1. We will simply note that this article reveals the clear traces of a purely local character, and what is particularly important, does not completely or exactly express the general tendency and character of this organ of the Petersburg workers, end quote. The first real attack on Robocha Musi came in response to issue number four, that is, the first issue in which the Kok Taktarev team made their voice heard. Issue number four contained a long editorial by Taktarev that seemed to cast aspersions on the priority of political freedom, and a short editorial that went out of its way to be offensive to the intelligentsia as a group. In response, 
D. Koltsov, a member of the Plikhanov group, criticized the anti-intelligentsia tone of the editorials while praising the correspondence coming from the workers themselves. Rabotya Musi responded in issue number 7 to Koltsov in a short editorial note. The tone of these short statements did as much to damage Rabotya Musi's reputation as did the programmatic heresies of larger editorials. This particular note managed to be both abrasive and evasive. It announced that two abusive articles had recently appeared in the journal Robotnik, one of them directed against Robotya Musi, which, however, did not respond to abuse. Quote, we do not consider it necessary to analyze the quasi-serious positive part of Dick Koltsov's article about us since his revolutionary theory, the organization of intelligenti of small circles of advanced workers for the overthrow of the autocracy, seems to us to be a theory that has outlived its time. A theory that everybody has left behind, in which there is very little sense indeed of reality or any understanding of it. End quote. This note in Rabotya Musi led in return to a harsh attack on Rabotya Musi by Rabotchi Diela editor Pavel Teplov under the pen name Sibiriak, the Siberian. Teplov's attack was a response not only to issue number 7, but the separate supplement of September 1898. The title of the article, Polemical Beauties of the Rabotya Musi Editorialists, sets out the basic themes, namely that the voice of the editorials was not the voice of the local Rabotya Musi group nor of Russian social democracy. Recall that, since issue number 5, Rabotya Musi billed itself as the official organ of the local social democratic committee. Quote, Bitter necessity compels us to a clarification of our attitude towards the editorial board of Rabotya Musi. We definitely mean editorial board, because the question does not concern the newspaper of the Petersburg workers itself, nor the articles and reports that are written by comrades working in Russia, and that provide excellent reading material for the wide mass of Petersburg workers, that is, as opposed to more advanced workers. The question concerns exclusively the articles and polemical remarks of the editorial board. End quote. Teplov pointed to the tactlessness of Rabotya Musi's polemics. A newspaper intended for a mass worker audience tells its readers that there is an abusive journal called Robotnik and then refuses to inform them what the issues are beyond a caricature of Kultsov's position, and Rabotya Musi complains of uncomradely polemics. Teplov also reacted strongly to the anti-intelligentsia stand of the newspaper, a stand that in the separate supplement was blown up into a full-scale rejection of the Russian revolutionary heritage. For example, one article in the separate supplement dismisses the To the People crusade of the 1870s as fantastic hocus-pocus. As noted earlier, Rabotya Musi later retracted this particular article. For our purposes, the most important item is Teplov's critique of the Intelligentsia editorial in issue number one. This editorial is the main Rabotya Musi document cited in What is to be Done, where Lenin's whole aim is to cast Rabotchi Diela as the follower of the spirit of Rabotya Musi. Yet here, Rabotchi Diela is attacking this very editorial in 1899. Quote, in the programmatic article of Rabotya Musi No. 1, the editorial board comes forward with grave and unjust accusations against the revolutionary intelligentsia, labeling the intelligentnya leader guides as the chief reason for the failures of the Russian worker movement. As long as the movement was only a means for soothing the bad conscience of the repentant, for what, intelligent, it was alien to the actual worker. This same, repentant intelligent, is also accused of not knowing what to fight for, with whom, and for what motive, as well as for an unceasing striving not to forget the political ideal. A striving very harmful, in the opinion of the editorial board of Rabotya Musi, to the success of the worker movement. Evidently, the editorial board got an earful of very bitter truths about its views from Russian comrades and was compelled to explain itself." End quote. Finally, Teplov criticized the anti-political tone of the lead editorial in issue number 7 by Tokhtarev. Tokhtarev had criticized May Day proclamations issued by Russian social democratic committees because they made broad political demands that did not fit the workers' real demands. Tokhtarev claimed that the real demands of the workers were much more narrow and apolitical. In response, Teplov also quoted another May Day proclamation that was issued in 1898 by the local Rabotya Musi group itself. Quote, 
fraternally, tirelessly, showing no fear of the gendarmes, showing no fear of the government, we will acquire the right of strikes, the right to join unions, to set up worker funds and meetings, freedom of speech and press, political freedom. End quote. Thus, the immigre Rabochiamusi editorialists seem to be polemicizing not only with the local Social Democratic Committee, but with the local St. Petersburg Rabochiamusi group. Rabochiamusi replied to this criticism in another short editorial note with a familiar, truculently evasive tone. Quote, in reference to Sibiriak's article on number 4 and 5, Roboci Diela, he has not given himself the trouble to examine the least bit attentively the outlook of Rabochia Musi, nor to understand it thoroughly, and for that reason we consider it completely superfluous to respond to the article of Mr., that is, not Comrade, Sibiriak, and to demonstrate that Rabochia Musi acknowledged politics. We do not consider it possible to initiate our comrades, the workers, into all these petty details of mutual recrimination. Rabochia Musi has been and remains the practical organ of the Petersburg workers. End quote. I have examined Teplov's criticism in detail because it establishes a number of important points. A negative view of the Rabochia Musi editorials was a social democratic consensus by 1899. Despite the fact that Rabochi Diela and the Plikonov group were at loggerheads, Teplov supported Kultsov's criticism. Contrary to the impression given both by Lenin and modern scholars, Rabochi Diela was not an advocate and moderate form of Rabochi Musi's economism, but rather a determined enemy from the very beginning. Deplov also makes a good factual case that the immigre editorial board did not represent the views of the Petersburg Rabochi Musi group, which seems to have been more political and revolutionary than its reputation. We return to our survey of reader response to Rabochi Musi. Dr. Rev's separate supplement came out in September 1899. We happen to have a private reaction to it by M. I. Tugan Baranovsky, a noted legally permitted Marxist, someone who was able to publish censor approved Marxist articles in the Russian press, and critic, that is, revisionist. Tugan Baranovsky's actual stay in social democracy was brief, but his reputation as an economic historian lives on today. Evidently, Takhturev had shown him a draft of the programmatic article in the separate supplement. This article made my hair stand on end. A high school student could have done as well. I pointed out and corrected some of the most glaring errors, but the article is still really awful. The separate supplement also roused Lenin, out in Siberian exile, to respond. Besides the programmatic article by Takhturev just mentioned, the separate supplement contained an article by Edward Bernstein, a sympathetic analysis of Bernsteinism and articles on Chernyshevsky that used Lenin's hero to discredit the entire Russian revolutionary tradition. In his critique, Lenin made a distinction between the useful side and the harmful side of Rabochia Musi. Quote, as long as Rabochia Musi, evidently adapting itself to the lower strata of the proletariat, assiduously avoided the issue of the final aim of socialism and the political struggle, but made no explicit declaration of a special tendency of its own, many social democrats only shook their head, hoping that with the development and broadening of their work, the members of the Rabochia Musi group would on their own easily free themselves from their narrowness. But when people who have previously carried out the useful work of a preparatory class start to make a noise all over Europe, latching on to fashionable theories of opportunism, and declare that they want to put all of Russian social democracy in the preparatory class for many years, if not forever, when, in other words, people who have been laboring usefully over a barrel of honey begin, in full view of the public, to pour ladles of tar into it, then we must resolutely rise up against this retrograde tendency. End quote. Lenin's very important article is discussed in other places in this commentary. Here, I will only point out that Lenin is not at all exercised by Rabochia Musi's anti-intellectualism. His critique does not mention the anti-intelligentsia editorial in issue number one, that is his main text and what is to be done. Rather, he focused exclusively on the empirical question of whether the Russian worker movement will or will not respond to revolutionary appeals. Lenin's only comment on the worker intelligentsia issue is the following, and RM is the pseudonym used by Takhtarev for the separate supplement. Quote, RM says, The attitude of the advanced strata of the workers to such a government, the autocracy, is as easy to understand as the attitude of the workers to factory owners. This means, healthy common sense concludes 
that the advanced strata of the workers are no less purposive than the socialists from among the intelligenti, and that, therefore, the striving of Rabochio Musi to separate the two is absurd and harmful. This means that the Russian worker class has already created and has independently pushed forward elements for the formation of an independent political worker party. End quote. Rabochio Musi became an issue in the war between the Plukhanov group and Rabochi Diela that broke out into the open in early 1900. Plikhanov accused Rabochi Diela of refusing to combat economism, even when carried to the point of absurdity, as in the case of Rabochi Musi. Boris Krichevsky, the chief editor of Rabochi Diela, was able to point to the Teplov critique of Rabochi Musi discussed earlier, but, continued Krichevsky, there were no grounds to equate even the editorial views of Rabochi Musi with economists of the Kreta type. The newspaper's editors were confused and tactless, but no worse. In any event, these views had nothing to do with social democratic workers in St. Petersburg. Quote, the tendency of the editorial board of Rabochio Musi contradicts sharply the overall character of the activity and views, not only of the St. Petersburg Committee of the Russian Social Democratic Party in general, but the Petersburg worker movement in particular. The explanation of this seemingly incredible fact is given by the outrageous conditions of illegal publishing created by the Tsarist Bashabazooks. If you remove the confused and tactless articles of the editorial board, the newspaper of the Petersburg workers is not a model of the economist tendency pushed to absurdity, but rather the first attempt at creating in Russia an organ for the broad masses of the worker class, accessible to their understanding, dedicated to their urgent needs and to topical issues, to specific clashes, especially those arising from economic struggle." End quote. Krichevsky wanted to defend Rabochio Musi. The only way he could do so was to say, ignore the editorials. By 1901, Rabochio Musi had changed editorial direction, and critiques were no longer directed at its current stance. Nevertheless, the old Rabochio Musi continued to be bandied about in polemics. In the very first issue of Iskra, December 1900, Murtov devoted an article to Zupatov and his police unions. The police official Zupatov promised workers that the Tsarist government would support their just demands, and some workers took the bait. Muratov added a sarcastic aside about these deluded workers. Probably the poor guys have been reading too much for Rabochia Musi. Martov went so far as to ironically dedicate his article, An Attack on Police Unions, to Rabochia Musi. Muratov's sally was directed against the de facto tolerance strategy discussed earlier. Programmatically, Muratov may have had a point, but polemically, he could not have been more tactlessly offensive. Muratov's implied accusation that Rabochia Musi and Zupatov were working together became a symbol of Iskra's take-no-prisoners polemical belligerence. A worker in Petersburg wrote an indignant letter into Rabochi Diela, defending his comrades who had risked their safety and freedom to distribute Rabochia Musi. They definitely had not done this to help Zupatov. The worker also included an eloquent description of how Rabochia Musi's hard-driving exposés of factory abuses had gradually opened the minds of many of the less developed workers to more kindly thoughts about the socialists. Rabochi Diela was glad to print this letter that was so critical of Iskra, and also glad to document the revolutionizing significance of economic struggle in its printed propaganda. Even so, the editorial introduction to the letter, undoubtedly written by Martinov, felt compelled to argue with the author of the letter and to utter one of the sharpest critiques of Rabochi Musi to date. The result is rather ironic. When this issue of Rabochi Diela came out, Lenin was already busy writing what is to be done, which sought to prove that Rabochi Diela was the Rabochi Musi of today. Martinov insisted that there was no excuse for the deliberate downplaying of political struggle in the early issues of Rabochi Musi, nor for its narrowing of political tasks in all issues until recently. Rabochio Musi claimed not to be programmatic, but the notorious call not to obsess about political freedom was nothing if not programmatic. Rabochio Musi's claim that it represented the view of advanced Russian workers had no foundation. 
quote, The editorial articles of the former Rabochia Musi were in no way dictated by the condition of the Petersburg movement at that time, nor by the character of the newspaper itself. The editorial board acted in a way directly opposed to the basic task of a social democratic newspaper when it attempted to inject into the worker mass false views about political struggle. The only value of these views was their inaccessibility and therefore lack of harm for the mass. But if the theoretical confusion of the editorial articles was unheeded by the mass reader, it undoubtedly had a harmful influence on more developed readers, and in particular on the activity of social democratic organizations. End quote. Rabochio Musi plays a small but vital role in what is to be done itself. Lenin did not use his extensive 1899 critique of the separate supplement, although he does mention that the supplement sums up the whole spirit of Rabochio Musi and quotes it once or twice. Instead, he went back to the Intelligentsia editorial from Rabochio Musi No. 1. Why did he dig up an article that he himself described as little known and practically forgotten today? Lenin wanted to present Rabochio Musi as the bottom of the slippery slope down which Rabochi Diela, his real foe, had begun to slide. Rabochio Musi was the most direct and open advocate of economism, while Rabochi Diela was a confused and evasive one. Lenin's aim is simply to ensure that the can of Rabochio Musi was firmly tied to the Rabochi Diela tail. This rhetorical strategy depends on the audience taking it for granted that the old Rabochio Musi was indeed a bad thing. Later in 1902 appeared K. M. Taktarev's History of the Petersburg Worker Movement, written partly in reaction to what is to be done. Much of the book was devoted to Rabochio Musi. If there was one person responsible for Rabochio Musi's bad reputation, it was Taktarev, whose lead articles, especially in issues 4, 7, and in the separate supplement, set out the views so universally condemned in social democratic circles. By 1902, the revolutionary atmosphere was quite different from 1898 and 9, and Tokterev and his wife Yakubova now supported Iskra and wrote a public letter to that effect. What is remarkable about his 1902 book is that Tokterev apologized for his editorials and asked that Rabochio Musi itself not be held responsible for them. Tokterev's apology has not been noticed heretofore because he issued the apology without stating directly that he had written the offending articles. Armed with the knowledge that Tokterev did write these editorials, we can better appreciate what he's trying to say. Tokterev first describes the situation in 1898 when Rabochio Musi began to be printed abroad. There was a downside to this situation. Quote, it must be admitted that the most negative aspect of an émigré editorial board was that owing to the transfer abroad of the printing, the St. Petersburg group publishing Rabochio Musi was deprived of the unconditional guarantee of their exclusive editorial rights that this group enjoyed, when it held directly in its hands the entire business of publishing Rabochio Musi. And it seems to me that this negative aspect of the transfer abroad of the printing of Rabochio Musi made itself known partly in issue number four. End quote. Later, he tells us about the situation in 1899 after arrests had wiped out the Rabochio Musi group in St. Petersburg. The foreign editors decided to go ahead with prepared material for issue number seven and to add on an editorial. Quote, a lead article was hastily written by members of the group that found themselves abroad at that time, and one must recognize that it was written in a rather one-sided fashion. This article really could be called a sort of preaching of Tred Unyanism, but responsibility for it should fall neither on the Petersburg Rabochio Musi group nor on the Petersburg Union of Struggle. The same thing can be said with even greater justice about the separate supplement. End quote. These remarks are the only negative comments Taktarev makes about Rabochio Musi. He then asks that Rabochio Musi be judged only according to early issues. The import is clear. The spirit of Rabochio Musi should not be judged by my editorials in number four and number seven, nor by my article in the separate supplement, since they were one-sided and in any event not the responsibility of the local group. Tokhtarev's comments, veiled as they are, are credibly gallant. His gallantry is somewhat dimmed by his refusal to come clean about his authorship in the expanded version of his book in 1924. The second comment is missing, and Tokhtarev does not even mention the separate supplement. One reason for his coyness may have been that his wife and Lenin's wife were very close friends, and that Tokhtarev continued to be a personal friend of Lenin after Tokhtarev left political activity to become a sociologist. 
In 1904, Akimov came out with the rather superficial defense of Rabochiomosi quoted earlier. He simply assumed all opposition to it came from a condescending attitude toward the workers. Even Akimov felt that the St. Petersburg economists had made errors, although forgivable ones. In 1906, M. Lyadov published his party history from a pro-Iskra, pro-Lenin perspective, although in later years, Lyadov lost his faith in Lenin. He challenged both Takhtarev and Akimov about Rabochiomosi. Lyotov added two new thoughts about the division that previous writers had made between the worker voice and the editorial voice. He described the anti-intellectualism of the editorialists as an expression of intelligentsia self-abasement that had nothing to do with the attitudes of real workers. He also argued that in one respect, the Robocio Musi editorialists did reflect the outlook of many workers who made an overly sanguine extension of their 1896-9 successes into the future. But instead of countering this naive view, these editorialists erected it into a matter of principle. See my discussion earlier of the de facto tolerance strategy. This survey of social democratic reaction to Rabochia Musi, which is at the same time a survey of the earliest and most fundamental historiography on the topic, shows that Rabochia Musi was welcomed insofar as it was the expression of militant worker protest. The newspaper caused scandal because of the elaborate programmatic claims made by intelligentsia and emigre editorialists, principally Takhtarev. The hostility to Rabochia Musi's programmatic stance was strikingly unanimous across the social democratic spectrum, from Kuskova and Tugan Baranovsky on the extreme right, through Rabochi Diela and on to Iskra and Lyadov. Even the main author of the programmatic articles, Takhtarev, condemned them in 1902 as one-sided and tred unionist. All these critics argued that Rabochia Musi editorials did not reflect the views of the workers in general or even the St. Petersburg Rabochia Musi group. This assertion is most convincing coming from those who were best disposed and best informed about Rabochia Musi, namely Rabochi Diela and Takhtarev himself. I conclude that the burden of proof is on anyone who argues that the Rabochia Musi editorials were the voice of the workers, or that opposition to Rabochia Musi's programmatic stance meant opposition to the workers. Workers versus Intellectuals? We have completed our survey of Rabochia Musi. There remains one further question to explore. Perhaps Rabochia Musi was just one symptom of a long-standing clash between revolutionary intellectuals and workers who resented their tutelage. In 1924, Takhtarev claimed that this kind of concrete issue was the inspiration of Rabochia Musi. Quote, Rabochia Musi arose against the position that was created in Russian social democratic organizations in which intellectuals, thanks to the conditions of the development of the Russian social democratic movement, took over for themselves the role of exclusive leader guides and pushed out the workers from the guidance of their own movement. End quote. The clash is symbolized by a meeting that took place in Petersburg in early 1897 and that later became famous. Present at the meeting were some activists on their way to Siberian exile, Lenin, Mortov, and others, as well as some of the local activists still at large. This meeting would have been totally forgotten if Lenin had not briefly described it in what is to be done as an early manifestation of the later division between economist and orthodox. According to Lenin, the dispute that arose at the meeting was whether priority should be given to worker strike funds or to an organization of revolutionaries. Takhtarev's book that came out later in 1902 disputed Lenin's account of the issues, claiming that Lenin and other veterans opposed the entry of workers into the Social Democratic Committee. After that, various participants weighed in with memoir accounts. Wildman and others have seen the clash at this meeting as an early sign of the central split within Russian social democracy. The workers wanted to take over their own revolution, while Lenin and co. insisted on preserving an intelligentsia monopoly of leadership. It was this practical challenge, rather than any ideological revisionism, that worried and indeed frightened Lenin. It is outside the purview of this commentary to write the history of Russian social democracy that would be needed to fully explore this issue, but I will briefly outline my reasons for rejecting the Wildman interpretation. First, did anybody ever oppose the entry of workers as such into leadership positions simply because they were workers? I find this impossible to believe. 
After going through various descriptions of the 1897 meeting, I conclude that there is no reason to accept Taktarev's partisan account of his opponent's case. Even Taktarev's account does not quite accuse his opponents of seeking to exclude workers on principles as implied by Wildman and others. Much more plausible is Lyotov's description, based on first-hand experience, of the general mood among the social democratic intelligentsia. The ideal for all praktiki was to carry out matters in such a way that purposive workers would stand at the head of social democratic work. There were, indeed, arguments about whether this or that individual worker was sufficiently purposive to be recruited into leadership, but the more experienced praktiki, while not automatically idealizing each and every worker like many neophytes, regarded purpose of workers as their equals, and saw their participation as leader guides not only as desirable, but necessary. Of course, the actual interaction was fraught with much more ambiguity than Lyotov's account suggests, yet I see no reason to reject his description of strongly held beliefs. Second, granted that there was dissatisfaction among some Petersburg workers about their lack of membership on the Social Democratic Committee, can we accept Taktarev's claim that this issue inspired Rabotia Musi either at the beginning or later? Taktarev relies on written evidence. He was in Western Europe when Rabotia Musi originated in 1897. He points to the Intelligentsia editorial in issue number one discussed earlier. He also provides the text of other unpublished worker submissions, but these admittedly fascinating documents do not really say what Taktarev claims they do. Most of the anti-intelligentsia potshots published in Rabotia Musi were added by the foreign editors and do not seem related to the local organizational issue. Also relevant is the defense of Rabotia Musi discussed in the previous section that was published by Rabotia Diela by a St. Petersburg worker. This valuable letter describes the reaction of both advanced workers and average workers to Rabotia Musi. There is not a trace of the worker intellectual tension that Taktarev claims was central. A worker group did arise in St. Petersburg based on this organizational class, the Worker Self-Liberation Group. The manifesto of this group did complain about workers being denied entry into top social democratic institutions. The group's resentment on the behalf of advanced workers seems distant from Rabotia Musi's emphasis on the average worker and the economic struggle. Third, was the kind of clash described by Taktarev the real meaning of the later division between economists and the orthodox politicals? An affirmative answer to this question is the heart of the Wildman interpretation. On this issue, I agree with Taktarev himself. When he challenged Lenin in 1902 about the 1897 meeting, his whole point was to deny that it reflected later divisions. In setting forth his account of the clash, he further assumed that his readers in 1902 would barely be able to conceive the issues at stake in 1897. Quote, At the present time, there will be hardly anybody among the active Petersburg comrades who will dispute, or even more, object on any grounds to the significance of the present mixed makeup of the Union of Struggle, the local social democratic committee, into which both workers and intellectuals enter on equal ground. There hardly could be anybody these days who would have any objection to the idea that an educated and practical worker can fulfill the role of an organizer of the workers more confidently and competently and at a higher level of conspiristia than an intellectual who does not know the worker milieu so well, nor is known so well by this milieu. But these self-evident truths were not so self-evident in 1896. End quote. There were, of course, various kinds of tensions between social democrats of different class origins. Nevertheless, I see little evidence of a fundamental clash between the people Wildman calls worker files versus the others that he implies were worker phobes. I see no actual social democratic currents that can be usefully described as either pro-intelligentsia or anti-worker. There were anti-intelligentsia currents and in response and anti-anti-intelligentsia backlash, that is, people opposed to any exclusionary policy aimed at intellectuals. But this was a relatively minor clash since almost the entire range of social democracy was anti-anti-intelligentsia, as shown by the reaction to Rabotia Musi. After what is to be done was published, serious conflict arose over the status of worker committees and several city organizations in Russia, ending with the disbandment of special worker committees in favor of unified committees. This episode has yet to be fully described. My belief is that Iskro's campaign against these organizations was not motivated by any sort of distrust of workers or by any anti-worker outlook. 
but if anything, by an overconfidence that the workers would be fully represented on the unified committees without any need of affirmative action. Such, in any event, is the brunt of a Menshevik criticism of Lenin on this issue. Next, did Rabotia Musi set forth a philosophy of leadership that was fundamentally different from orthodox Russian social democracy? Such is the opinion of Wildman, who sums up the spirit of Tukhtarev's editorials, which he believes to be the spirit of Rabotia Musi as a whole, in the following way. Worker initiative alone was to determine the direction of the movement, obviating the need for social democratic leadership, or in other words, an opting for spontaneity in place of consciousness. Wildman's statement is plainly an attempt to extend the framework of the textbook interpretation of what is to be done to Russian social democracy as a whole. Thus, he equates spontaneity with worker initiative and consciousness with social democratic leadership. He then claims Rabotia Musi is for spontaneity and therefore against social democratic leadership. But this affirmation is doubly wrong. Spontaneity is a translation of stihinust, a Russian word that connotes chaotic and disorganized struggle, and the whole argument of the economists was that the most crying need of the Russian worker movement was organization, by which they meant conscious or purposive organization. And on the other hand, while Rabotia Musi was certainly for worker initiative, was anybody against it? It was just as certainly not against social democratic leadership. It separated from the social democratic mainstream primarily on the empirical possibilities of that leadership. It is worthwhile documenting Rabotia Musi's desire to replace Stihinust with consciousness as quickly as possible. According to the Intelligentsia editorial in issue number one, previous strikes were Stihini explosions. This era was moving into the past, and the current organizational striving among the workers represented the transition to a fully purposive or conscious era of the movement. In Taktorev's editorials, he pictured a ladder that started with non-purposive protests and strikes, and then moved on to higher and higher stages in which the workers acquired a greater feeling of social responsibility and a more correct understanding of their interests. Tukhtarev did not deny the role of social democratic leadership, but maintained that it had to set its sights low for the time being, given the present lack of awareness among the workers of their actual interests. Quote, Unity and organization without awareness or consciousness is impossible, but the job is already half done when we see the first glimmer of awareness. Of course, not all workers completely understand their own cause. The time is still remote when the workers of an entire factory will come together purposively, saznatilnya, as one person. End quote. At present, the degree of awareness of their social interests and of what is to their advantage that exists even among, say, urban and capital city workers leaves much to be desired. Both orthodox and economists thought that a stihini level of organization was entirely undesirable and should be replaced by purpose of organization as soon as possible. The crucial dispute was, how soon was this possible? And on this empirical dispute we find the usual division. The economists insisted on the low existing level of workers' purposiveness, while the orthodox insisted on both a higher present level of awareness and the potential for a more rapid movement forward. I also cannot accept Wildman's view of Tukhtarev as someone who believed that worker initiative alone was to determine the direction of the movement. Tukhtarev was an intellectual, who had a strong sense of the workers' real interests and used the leadership mechanisms available to him, in this case an editorial board onto which he was co-opted to ensure that the workers accepted his vision of their interests. Tukhtarev's political program was based on his view of worker interests, his empirical contact with the workers, his reading of their aspirations, his view of the dynamics of the autocracy, and finally on a choice between the various strategies pursued in Western Europe. Exactly the same is true of Lenin. Both men wanted to raise the consciousness of the workers and not just to reflect their current mood. Both expected the workers to eventually accept their respective visions of worker interests. Both accused each other of neglecting the actual aspirations of the workers. Since both men were emigres, their empirical contact with Russian workers was mainly through written materials or second-hand accounts, so I find it difficult to see why one should be called a worker-file advocate of worker initiative and the other an enemy of it. I should add a personal opinion here. I gather that Wildman and others in his tradition very much favor the self-effacing worker-file intellectual who either has no concrete view of worker interests or who feels honor-bound to suppress or muffle his own opinion. 
From this point of view, my description of Tokhtarev will be taken as a critical expose. But from my point of view, an intellectual or anybody else who is involved in worker affairs should have firm opinions about the worker's real interests and should strive to persuade the workers to accept his views. The important clashes in Russian social democracy were never between intellectuals on the one hand and workers allied with self-effacing worker files on the other. Rather, some workers and some intellectuals had a different concrete concept of worker interests than some other workers and some other intellectuals. And this is how it should be. Finally, did Russian social democrats have other good reasons to get upset at Rabotia Musi apart from their alleged desire to quash the worker bid for self-liberation? Yes. If Rabotia Musi had just expressed the voice of the militant workers, no one would have strongly objected. If Rabotia Musi had merely restricted itself to the economic struggle, there would have been complaints and calls for a more advanced and more political newspaper. We shall later cite such complaints by Rabotia Diela writers. If Rabotia Musi's one venture into programmatic assertions had been the editorials in the first issue, its transgressions would soon have been forgotten. What made Rabotia Musi a hissing, and a byword in Russian social democracy was its status as the official organ of a social democratic committee combined with Tokhtarev's ambitious and aggressive programmatic articles in number 4, number 7, and the separate supplement. This combination could not be ignored. Tokhtarev's editorials, along with the shorter editorial statements that he might also have written, attacked other social democratic groups while claiming immunity from counterattacks because Rabotia Musi was a soi de son, voice of the Petersburg worker. This claim was widely, and I think accurately, felt to be very shaky. The Tokhtarev editorials carried the anti-intellectualism expressed en passant in the first issue to the extreme of rejecting the entire previous Russian revolutionary tradition. The separate supplement even provided a platform for Eduard Bernstein, thus, among other things, giving credence to Bernstein's claim that Russian groups supported him. Tokhtarev later claimed that his editorials were not anti-political, but practically every reference to political freedom and to revolution in these writings was sarcastic and dismissive. The de facto tolerance strategy may have reflected worker opinions, but most social democrats thought it was based on illusion and profoundly harmful. And all of this was trumpeted to friend and foe alike as the authoritative voice of social democracy in Russia. When we looked at the editorials in issue number one, we noted that the worker editorial affirmed the idea of a worker mission, while the intelligentsia editorial implicitly dismissed it. Tokhtarev's editorials explicitly dismissed the idea of a mission, and given his anti refertian rejection of the SPD model, this is no surprise. Ironically, given that what is to be done itself is supposed to be homage to Chernyshevsky, Tokhtarev did so by means of a Chernyshevsky quotation that he used to provide a climax to his separate supplement. This quotation appropriately ends this chapter because it expresses the basic clash between the economists, Kuskova, Prokopovich, and the editorialists of Rabotia Musi, and the Erfurtians. This issue was not intelligentsia hegemony versus worker autonomy, but a romantic sense of a proletarian mission versus a skeptical refusal to enter into a world historical narrative. Quote, Do you think to measure the distant future with your habits, conceptions, and means of production? Do you think that your great-great-grandchildren will be the same as you? Don't worry, they will be smarter than you. Just think about how to arrange your own social life and leave any worries about the fate of your great-great-grandchildren to your great-great-grandchildren." End quote. 